So the Lord God made the earth, and on the second day, he made trees. And it also says that each of these trees had fruit and that they had seeds. Barry, thank you. you. You added so much, and I'm going to remind the congregation of something that you said just now. How many of you like peaches? How many of you like uh, mangoes? Oh, bigger response. Okay, I hit a, hit a good one. How many of you like uh, apples? Okay, good, good. Um, how many of you know what a Fuji apple looks and tastes like? Okay, very good. I had the honor of working with a man who actually just passed away. Very sad that, that he's gone, but... Sam Lafour was part of a Russian family that moved into the Walla Walla Valley. In our Sabbath school class this morning, we had two uh, young people in their 80s um, who were from the Walla Walla Valley and uh, uh, are visiting their family again and decided to go visit them now during church service, which is great. But they're saying that when they wake up in the Walla Walla Valley right now, it's 20 degrees. So it's still cold in the Walla Walla Valley. And I said, is that good for the grapes? And he said, yes, it's, it's, it's good that it stays cool in the spring for the grapes. Because unlike when I lived in the Walla Walla Valley with Sam LaFour, who, who had his own sticker to put on his own apples. So if you ever ate an apple that had that sticker on it that said, Sweet Sam, that was from Sam LaFour's orchards. A lot of those orchards have now been taken out. I don't know about Sam's orchards, but, but a lot of the orchards in the Walla Walla Valley have been taken out because they have planted vineyards. If you didn't know, you Napa people, the next Napa Valley is the Walla Walla Valley. And it's been coming on for the last 20 plus years that Onions have been coming out. How many of you have ever had a sweet Walla Walla sweet onion? Oh, my goodness. Oh, no. These people, I think, Greg, these people are into Vidalia sweet onion. Any of you had a Vidalia sweet onion? Okay, so you know Vidalia. That's from Georgia all the way across the country. But on this side of the continent, you've got to have a Walla Walla sweet. Try it. Get one this summer because they only come from the Walla Walla Valley, and they are so sweet as an onion you can just slice them and put them on bread with tomato. I'm sorry to make you hungry so early in the, you know, we do have potluck coming for you, but just understand that Walla Walla is known for its onions. It's also known for its apples. And you think Washington apples? Yes, we know about this. But did you know that the state line is right there? And so northern Oregon, which is Milton Freewater, same valley, just over the line, is where Sam lived. And Sam took me into one of his orchards one day, and he, he had a pocket knife with him. Pulls out his pocket knife, and he pulls off a big, big Fuji apple. Now, Fuji apples, as you might imagine, come from Japan, right? And over there, they are so important to the apple crop that they go out, they send people out into the orchard to put bags around the apples as they are forming to keep any possible blemish from happening. Sam took me, he pulls this apple off the tree, he cuts it open, and as he cuts it open, water, juice, comes right out of the apple. And he taught me that day about the water core. So did you know, Fuji's, at least the big ones, are supposed to have a water core in them. And that they are so juicy that that is why people love them and, and, and want them. Why am I speaking about uh, fruit? Except that it is the fruit that we love so much and the seed that we throw away. Biologists will tell us, do you remember this from your biology lesson in, in high school? What is the true fruit? 
It's the seed. So let me ask you another technical question. What is the true fruit of a strawberry? Those little things that get caught in your teeth. Those tiny little dots on the outside of what is called the false fruit. The thing you actually eat a strawberry for. The wonderful red juicy meat of the strawberry. That's what you eat it for. That's actually called the false fruit. When you see a peach on the ground, as I have several times, because uh, where, where I lived in Reno, my neighbor had a, had a peach tree. It was wonderful. He overwatered it one year. It was really wonderful because it bore so much fruit. But when the peaches on the ground begin to turn brown, what is happening? That outside thing that we like to eat is actually becoming the fertilizer for the seed. Most amazing, most amazing. As I saw this group up here this morning, Barry, I thought, oh my goodness, we are growing a new crop of trees because God has blessed this congregation and you have been fruitful and multiplied and the seed is growing. Yes, we are getting a little less beautiful. We're not in our prime anymore as the older ones. We're basically infusing our life into our children, are we not? And all of this, my friends, all of this was the way that God designed it to be when he created the world. And on the second day, even before he creates the sun and the moon, on the second day, he creates trees. So I believe the light that comes into the world that is God is what, keep, is what was keeping these trees alive in, in the creation order. Turn with me. Turn with me. If you, if you don't believe me, there's a Bible right in front of you. I went throughout the sanctuary this morning just to make sure that we had plenty of Bibles. And, uh, or or go, on your, go on your phone and, and, and let's look at it. I, I want you to see it because when you see it, it, I think, makes a bigger impression upon you. Second day, and God said, this is Genesis 1 verse 9, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place. Okay? And let dry land appear, and let dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry, land, dry ground land, actually gave that name to it. And he gathered the waters and he called them seas. We might also call them lakes. And God saw that it was good. And then he said, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. And the land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. So as we think of this parallel tree that last week we started with tree number one in the Garden of Eden, and we're going to refer to it again in a moment, as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So today, I thought we would finish the set with the second tree. But hold on to your thoughts, because this week I've been inspired that there is a third tree. And uh, I think it was Barry who, who actually helped that inspiration. And that's where I'll be referring to your story, Barry. We go to the second, let's go to the second chapter of, of, of Genesis, Genesis 2, ge the, chapter 2, and here we have another account of the creation, only this time it includes the creation of Adam and Eve. They're in the garden. This is the garden of God, and you see God making Adam, making him out of the ground, and just a quick reminder uh, if you ever want to do a study on the soul, 
This is the text you need to be reading is Genesis chapter 2 because you need to be able to do the math. Did you know that there was math involved with the study of the soul? Because you see God creates a living soul, does he not? How does he do it? He does it with a body which he makes from the dirt. Yes, we are formed from the earth. And then he does what into Adam's nostrils? He breathes in his powerful breath of life, which, by the way, you were breathing all last night and the nights before in your life. And this morning, when you were woken up by your body clock, even though it might still be off from the time change, you were woken up again by the breath of God. That is the spark of life that is within you. And so it takes one plus one to make what he calls here a living soul. So please understand that death is the subtraction process, not the addition process. And that when you subtract the breath of God, what do you have left? A body that we know deteriorates. There's not a soul left because it takes the two pieces together to make a soul. That, that was free for you today. That was a free piece, but I'm going to see, you'll see at the end how, how it all fits together. We're here in Genesis 2, and God is making Eve. Now, she's not known as Eve. She is known as the one who is taken from the rib that is, that, that is taken from Adam's side. Uh, ladies, please understand that uh, when Adam was made, he was lonely. I don't know. Wives, girlfriends, grandmothers, how many have ever known a lonely man in your life? Men get lonely. I'm lonely right now. You know why? My, my wife is on the women's retreat. Oh, shame. Several others. Yes, brother, I know your wife is there with her. We've got nine or ten, twelve ladies that are on the women's retreat right now. And you know what? She texted me this morning and it made my day. Okay, first thing. Darling, how are you doing? Just want you to know everything's going okay here. That's, you know, it's, it's because we are lonely for each other. Eve, Eve is made from Adam's rib and then the Bible says they are planted in the garden. This is where you find them. They are planted in the garden. Genesis chapter 3, turn, turn the page. Genesis chapter 3, it is a sad, sad story. We are not sure how long Adam and Eve lived in the garden before this happened, but what is recorded in Genesis 3 did happen. And in fact, it's why we're sitting here today is because of what happened in Genesis 3 because they were not exactly together when this crafty serpent came along and insinuated doubt. If you didn't know, that's all that he has to do. Uh, our jurisprudence system, our system of law today, uh, what, what will get you off when, when your lawyer works on your behalf? What is the only thing that your lawyer has to do in front of the jury? Reasonable doubt. Interesting that that is all that your lawyer has to do because it's exactly all that the serpent had to do with Eve. He created reasonable doubt in Eve's mind, and she bought it. She bought it, and she took the fruit. She decided to believe him when he said, you will not surely die. This is Genesis chapter 3, verse 4. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and that you will be like God, knowing good and evil. 
Now, I want to be like God. But the temptation here is not to be like God. It is to be God. So just know that the, that's, that's the crucial difference that we're seeing here in Genesis chapter 3. And when the woman saw, this is for another time, but watch it, look at it, read it several times this afternoon if you need to. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, number one, was pleasing to the eye, number two, and was desirable for gaining wisdom, number three, she took some and ate it. She also gave some, of the, some to her husband. And in that one little sentence right there, uh, we see that Adam has the opportunity to choose as well. But that he is choosing, he is choosing between whether or not he's going to stay with his, in, in, in his mind's eye, whether he, or not he's going to stay with Eve or that he is going to stay with God. And I, I, I know it's happening in, in, in my own family. And I'm sure it's happened in your family. That people have decided that they no longer want to be together. And the pain, the pain that happens because of that. It's pain because in the beginning when we were created, male and female created he them, and then they were bonded together and, and they were married and, 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 and they became one flesh. It's a very, very powerful bond. It takes a lot. It takes a lot to rip that bond apart. And in fact, it takes a lot to make you choose differently than your wife or choose differently than your husband. In my family, my, mother, my, my mother's mother stayed with my grandfather, who was a nasty man. Don't know why she called me John. It's my middle name. After my grandfather, this nasty guy. But she stayed with him as long as the children were home. But then finally, when they were all gone off to college, she, she did part from him and he died a single man of cirrhosis of the liver because, yes, he was a drunk. Drank himself to death. But she stayed because of that bond. She stayed there because of that bond. When she chose God, when she chose the church, and he didn't, I'm just going to tell you there was pain. There was pain and agony. It's why today when we, when we speak of, of the young, we, we plead with them. Uh, as, as you've heard me say, I, I pled with my daughter. I have only one thing that I want from you, daughter. Marry a Jesus boy. And this is the reason right here. Is because when faced with the decision to choose God or to choose his wife, Adam, the first man who was created by the hand of God himself, chooses his wife. So you cannot tell me that there is any, any stronger force in our world, in our, in our thinking today, than that of, of, of family and love for each other. We will do anything, including walk away from God. That's why I said it's, a, it's an incredible story. In Genesis chapter 3, you have, you have Adam choosing his wife and walking away from God. Well, the choice had consequences, as you might imagine, and Adam and his wife uh, are banished from the garden where they have been planted. In verse uh, 22 of Genesis chapter 3, God actually has a council amongst himself. Don't you love that? Father, Son, Holy... He has a council and he says, now they know... Good and evil. Is not that what Satan said would happen? God knew that that is what ha would happen as well. And he says 
amongst himself, as he has this counsel amongst himself, he says, now they know good and evil, so they've got to go. Because if we have them in this state, able to eat from the tree of life, then we're going to have this, this rebellious condition forever. And so our first parents had to be banished. They literally had to be uprooted from the Garden of Eden. We, we jump way forward, and, and, and I've got to, got to show you this because it is... Jesus, who speaks these words later on in his very church, in his very own synagogue uh, in Nazareth. And so therefore I'm jumping way forward and I'm, I'm, I'm including the fact that, that Eve was told, what was she told? She was told that she would bear fruit. We're talking about a tree today. And she would bear fruit and the seed... These are all words that you've heard before in sermons. You've read them in the Bible. But now you're seeing that this, this metaphor of tree is coming to a, a, a real point here. She bears fruit. She has a son. And ultimately that son, that Messiah, that Christ is Jesus. And he stands up one day in church and he reads Isaiah chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord, the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. And you think, oh, it's just those without money. No, my friends, the good news to the poor means the good news to all those who have chosen, like Adam and Eve, to disconnect themselves from the, the God of life. And are therefore poor in life. The good news to preach to the poor. Amen? Because I know that I'm one of the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the captives, the release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all those who mourn, to provide for those who grieve in Zion and to bestow a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. They... He's talking about the people of God now, these people, these poor people, the, the, the earth, they will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Now when you see, uh, again, and I, I go back to the Walla Walla Valley, when you see the way that they grow Fuji apples now, um, you're not really going to end up with a huge big apple tree because they are so interested in making sure that you get fruit right away very quickly so that you can get money on the return uh, for the return of the, the, the money that you have spent to grow the apples that they now grow trees on trellises like grapes. The trellis might be 15 feet high, it's in an A-frame, and they, they grow these tiny little saplings up the trellis, and then they train their branches out to the side. They put wires around the branches because they're going to produce in their second and third year of life apples that are so big that if they were left to their own devices would literally break the branch right off the tree. But the farmer is going to go through under the trellis. He's going to have people pick those apples and he is going to start making money back for all the money that he spent to grow the apples. Oaks of righteousness. My friends, ever since the uprooting of Adam and Eve from the garden, God has been interested in trees. He has been interested 
in planting them back in his garden. But we live, according to the prophet David, King David, we live in the valley of the shadow of death. There are tough things that are happening all around us. This week I went to the hospital more than I have been to the hospital in my entire time in Santa Clarita. And it wasn't just to Henry Mayo, it was down to Panorama. Because we've got church members in the hospital. People who have been oaks, oaks of righteousness. But that life and time and disease have now swept into their lives. It's time for us to gather around. Time for us to gather around those oaks and to love them and to take care of them because they are precious. They are precious to God. And he says that this is what brings Splendor, this is what brings glory to God, is these trees that are planted in his presence. He's looking forward very soon to replanting those trees in his garden again. Let me ask a question. How do we know that we are a planting of the Lord? How do we know? Here we sit in church on a Sabbath, and we can say, well, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. I come to church on Sabbath, and and, and I know that I'm a planting of the Lord because here I am. I'm, I'm not here on Sunday. I'm here on Sabbath because that's what God said. Good, good. Glad, glad that you are. But how do you know that that is That is what God wants from you, except that you have read his scriptures, except that you have listened to his Holy Spirit. Psalm chapter 1. Turn there, if you would, turn to Psalm chapter 1. It is is definitely a favorite, and it has been made into music, so we, we can all sing it even sometimes. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked... Or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight, his delight is the law of the Lord, and his law he meditates on day and night. And verse 3, this is why, you know, I would include this, he is like a tree. He is like a tree planted by the streams which yield its fruit in season. You see, as as we began today, we were talking about fruit. And what does a tree do? A tree produces fruit. This is what it is supposed to do. So here in this verse, we get an answer to my question of how do we know that we are a planting of the Lord? I believe we know because we are producing the fruit that we were supposed to. So when you think about a relationship with God, how do you know that that relationship is potent? How do you know that his sap is flowing through your branches? It'll be because like times like right now, trees are putting out new buds. They're putting out new pieces on that branch. And at the end of those buds is going to be a piece of fruit. Now, I love this tree right here. I mean, you can see that it's putting out buds. But its fruit are these spiny little things, right? They're actually seed pods or pods that carry seeds. It's quite an ingenious design. I mean, everything that God does is so ingenious. And you see them all over the ground. The last few that have been blown off the roof because it puts out hundreds, thousands of these seed pods after its design. So when you ask yourself, how do I know that I am a planting of the Lord? We can know because we do what he asks us to do and we produce the fruit that he asks us to produce. So you know, you know that I've got to go to Revelation 22 now as we, as we wind this up. Revelation 22, come on, it's one of my favorites because it's, it's, it's the end 
It's the end piece, and, and, and you, you like the end pieces because oftentimes, and in this case, very definitely, the end piece matches the beginning piece. Okay? So what do, what do we see in, in Revelation 22? Uh, Behold, I come quickly, I come soon, and my reward is with me. I like rewards, don't you? I like rewards. I, I, you, know, you, you saw Barry up here this morning, and that was good, Barry. Uh, you, you, I believe you had 100% attention. Parents, uh, note, take note of Barry's uh, very successful uh, technique here to this morning. I don't know if it works with your kids. Uh, maybe you just think, oh, that was terrible. He bribed them. Um, no, he was just offering a reward. I mean, it could have been a sucker. It could, oh, anyway. So, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Behold, Jesus says, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give everyone according to what they have done. And I might say, in the context of our study today, according to the fruit they have born. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes and those who have, the, they, that they may have, the Bible says, the right to eat from the tree of life. Well, where is this tree? You, you go back a few verses to the beginning of 22. The angel showed me, John says, the angel showed me a river. Didn't we just read in Psalms chapter 1 that they will be trees planted by a river? Okay, here we are. A river of the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God. Okay? Not going to go into all the imagery that is here, all the metaphors that are here that are being used that have definite huge spiritual impact, but I'll leave that to you to study and, to, and, and under the guidance of the Holy Spirit to come to a realization of. It's flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street in the city. I don't know if you've been to San Antonio, but there is a river in the middle of the city. And you can take rides on boats and there are restaurants and hotels and all sorts of things on either side of the river it's very nice. So if you're picturing the new Jerusalem right now in your mind, you, you have the throne of God and from the throne of God is flowing this river and it's going down the very middle of Main Street. Look what is there. On each side of the river stood the tree of life. Each side. How can it be each side? Well, it's got two trunks, obviously bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and leaves, the leaves of the tree will be for the healings of the nations. My friends, uh, in rereading this, in re-looking at it, which is why I commend the scriptures to you every week, because the fact is that you're going to be a week older this next week, and you're going to have some experiences that are going to cause you to read the scripture that you thought you read when you were 15, and now when you read it when you're 57, you will find that it looks different and it reads different because you've had more experience. So read it again, as I did this week, and realize that you have the number 12. 12 fruits. And it struck me again. This is the people of God. 12 is the number of the people of God. There are 12 different fruits that grow on the tree of life. So this is where Barry's branches come in. Nice idea, Barry. I like to think of my branches as being pretty big. What if we had to say that we are the trees of life? That we, when we accept the Holy Spirit's influence in our life, that we can be just like Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4 in the vision where Daniel sees Nebuchadnezzar as a big tree and the branches go out and yes, Barry, the birds nest in those branches. There is protection for the animals of the field under those branches. Is it possible that 
that even as the blind man in, in John chapter 10 saw trees the first time Jesus touched his eyes, and then when Jesus touches his eyes again, he sees people. Is it not maybe that Jesus is trying to tell us that we, in this time, in this place, are the trees of life? That the Holy Spirit invades our life, the Holy Spirit sap flows through us, and then the influence of our branches. The fruit of our labors and, 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 and our families, our children and our children's children become the splendor of God. To me, I want you to know that's a whole lot about now. The sweet by and by when we see this in Revelation, when we see this huge tree that comes over the top of the river of life and, and, and gives 12 different kinds. What if that's trying to tell us right now through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can be a tree of life? <clears throat> to me, I'm telling you, that's exciting. That's very, very exciting to think that the lifeblood of the universe can flow through me and be influential in my world, even though I live in the valley of the shadow of death. I can still be a tree of life. Just a thought. It's one that makes me very happy that I, I can look forward to this reward that is given to all who want it, and that will be given according to the fruit that is born, and that that fruit is because I am a tree of life now. I'm not just a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Yeah, we're all that. We know. God said we know the difference now. Sure. And sitting here right now, you are asking God for forgiveness because you know evil. And maybe you did evil as I did evil this week. And so we ask for forgiveness and we ask him to say, change us, God, change us from being a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's, that's old. That's not what we want to be. We want to be trees of life. Amen? Amen. This place should be different because the tree of life is in the midst. Let's make that so this week. Amen? Amen.